what we very much want it to be is a tool for grassroots organizations and others to use to help them do the good work that they're already doing. Right. And so the concept behind hosting a screening is either you're hosting a, a full screening in your community and doing a Q&A afterwards, you might decide that you just want to uh, show, uh, show clips and do conversations around specific topics. The act, actually, the documentary is structured in a way where it is chunked out so that people can just um, have a conversation around a certain aspect of, of the, the film. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Jennifer Boyd, the director and producer of The Street Project, a documentary film that we are going to be talking about here today. Uh, Jennifer Boyd is the director and producer of 25 different uh, documentaries, and she has won, I think, nine <laughs> Emmys uh, associated with uh, her films. And this film, which you can access at thestreetproject.com, is going to be an essential tool in our efforts to create more streets are for people, <laughs> or as she likes to call it, uh, more democratic streets. So I highly recommend that you take the opportunity to view the film as well as potentially host a screening in your community. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it. Jennifer Boyd. Well, I am absolutely delighted to welcome into the podcast, Jennifer Boyd. Jennifer, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Jennifer, um, one of the things I love to do with my guests is uh, give them the floor and let them introduce themselves. Uh, so who is Jennifer Boyd? Um, well, hello. I, um, I'm a producer, director, writer. I've been in this field for what I like to say is plus um, 20 years. I stopped counting after 20. And um, I have done uh, over 25 documentaries, a whole bunch of music shows. Um, my world has predominantly been um, the PBS world. Uh, I have a company called Boyd Productions, and I've focused a lot on transportation-related issues over the years. Um, but um, I do a variety of topics as well, and the yeah. history, etc. But that's who that's that's who I am. Yeah, that's who you are. That's great. And where are you, where are you based out of? Uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Oh my gosh! Okay, Hartford, Connecticut. That's one place I have not yet been. I, I need to get there. Yeah. So, uh, the reason we brought you here today <laughs> is because of this gem. <laughs> uh, the Street Project uh, is just been released, and it, it, it's an absolutely fantastic film. And we're going to be talking a, a little bit uh, more deeply about this. In fact, we're going to spend the whole time talking about it. Uh, but ta take us back a little bit. What was what got you? You said transportation related. What kind of got you in heading down that road? Pardon the yeah, pun. Yeah, um, you know it's it's a it is a strange story, I suppose. Um, over the years, I have done a variety of projects on transportation that mainly centered on um, safety, and whether it was um, issues surrounding senior drivers or children. Um, and then a while back, uh, somebody had suggested, hey, you know, this whole concept of texting and cell phones and all of that, you, you know, you really should you look into distracted driving. And so I uh, created a documentary called Three Seconds Behind the Wheel with the idea that it um, takes three seconds to, to get across. Right. A football field and, and you, your audience knows all about this. So three seconds behind the wheel. And it looked at distracted driving. But while I was doing the research on the topic, I, I realized that half of all pedestrian, um, half of all fatalities around the car happen inside the car and the other half happen outside of the car. Right. So, you know, it was the, the documentary was really interesting. People liked we put cameras into cars, followed people's behavior. MIT and Google and a whole bunch of folks helped us with the technology that we put into the cars. And um, we learned a lot about people's behavior. And right. this is a particularly interesting clip. Um, that was a complete surprise to us. The University of Connecticut actually went through hours and hours and hours of footage. Can you actually, you can't play that, right? Can I you think play we that? can. Yeah. Do you want oh. to? We yeah, can, you can we play, play a little stuff. bit of it, a lot of it. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> and this is brilliant, by the way. I love watching this. First, let me tell you what this story isn't about. This isn't a don't text or you'll die lecture. There are lots of those messages already out there. What the story is about is how and why we get distracted. Oh, good game. <laughs> and so we step into the private world of the driver. It's it's amazing. I know, I know. It's and and I highly recommend everybody. You know, click on the link in the video description. Uh, go to the show notes if you're listening to this on audio only. Uh, you'll want to make sure to 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 view the you know that the rest of that clip, but also the the film itself. Yeah. So that was so aside. yeah. So so that yeah. was like so, 2018. Yeah, and that came so. Out? Yeah, and I never expected to. I thought I was doing, in that case, a, a documentary really about um, texting and cell phone use, and and clearly there are, were a whole bunch of different ways that people get distracted right. in the car, and that's that's what was so fascinating about that project. Anyway, when that finished, um, it, it it was distributed by PBS International and on American Public Television, and. Um, it uh, had a lot of attention, and so I thought, all right, why don't I take a look at, at how distraction impacts behavior outside of the car? You right. know, there is that other half of, uh, of the population, and what's going on there? So that's what I thought I was doing a project on. I right. thought I was doing a project on people walking. Your, your viewers are right. going to hate this and listeners. I thought I was doing a project about people walking into the street distracted by their cell phones yeah. or, or getting run over on bikes by their, yeah. you know, distraction. And clearly, once I got into a few seconds of real research on the project, I realized that this pro this yeah. documentary was not about that at all. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's been a journey ever since right. because it was, um, you know, I started to get into the ur urban planning, the street design. I met Peter Norton. I met Jeff Speck. I met a whole bunch of people who really helped me to understand even my first shoots were with bike messengers in New York city, which I have a wonderful piece that's going to be in the bike film festival with yes. this guy, Kevin, who's an awesome bike messenger. But we ended up having to take that out because it, it wasn't about any of those things. Right, what it right. really, um, what it was about were all the things that your listeners and viewers know about road design, about um, sizes of vehicles and speed and, and how we think and talk about pedestrians and cyclists and treat them and a whole bunch of issues. And so slowly over time, our story developed with guidance from all of these people who live and breathe this topic on a daily basis. Right. And I was thankful that, you know, our, our team, we had a lot of time to really do the research. It just wasn't a run and gun. It took years, but it was okay. We had time. Right. And, uh, and then what happened is COVID hit and right. we canceled 40 days, 30 days of shooting in four countries. Wow. Um, and, uh, and stopped for two years. And then the story changed again because people started looking at, um, streets in a very different way, right? Right. Yeah. And we can, I'll stop talking for a moment, but there, so there were lots of different directions that we went in and it's, and it's a journey even today and where we're going with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good time to play the trailer. Oh, right. We haven't played that yet. Of course. Because <laughs> it's, it, I, I think that that's going to spur some additional, um, questions in both of our minds in terms of like where, where to go to next on this. Um, and, and for those, uh, you know, in the audience, if you haven't seen this film, I cannot recommend it enough. You, you really, uh, because if you tune off in the next two minutes, I want to make sure that I get that plug in here. You have to see this film. I've watched it three times. It's amazing. And, uh, and, and again, uh, let's, let's play this trailer and, uh, and have some fun with it. When we're thinking about pedestrian and cycling issues, what is the issue today? Survival. 
It's been a bloody 24 hours. More than a million people die in traffic-related crashes worldwide each year. It's really a big problem. Half of those deaths involve pedestrians and cyclists. Killed after being hit by a council bus. So why is this happening, and what can we do about it? Welcome to The Street Project. In our neighborhoods, the streets get wider, which encourage speeding. And as far as protected bike lanes, there are hardly any or none. Hi, crosswalk, crosswalk. That crosswalk over there turning is suicide by crosswalk 24-7. Really, really bizarrely, no one thought there was anything odd about having a road that was just the boulevard of death. My mother was walking when she was hit. I was biking when I was hit. That's just crazy. Yeah. That's no coincidence. Low-income communities are more susceptible to traffic violence. The forward-looking city is conscious of the automobile and automobile traffic as key factors. Like so many people these days, we live in the suburbs, and Dave needs the car every day for business. When he was gone, I was practically a prisoner in my own home. But that's all changed now. Well, the 1950s, when there was a massive urban transformation, we all believed in the car as the only vehicle that we'll ever need in the future. This transformed cities all over the world, and not least Copenhagen. And a lot of people look to the Nordics and say, oh, yeah, they just ride bikes because they're all so environmentally conscious, you know? The bicycle is a little pink unicorn for a better future. No. Whatever we grow up with seems normal. And this can make it really hard to recognize better possibilities. We're going to turn right, look left, and for that good reason, so we don't bump into all the cyclists here. On a bike lane like this, we can move 6,000 people per hour. We just did a little experiment, and we closed one street with the sandwich board and it said for emergency vehicles only. When we had COVID devastating this neighborhood, and all these people are dying. People living in parts of Queens and the Bronx have found themselves in the epicenter of the virus. You would come out here and the kids were having the best summer of their life. <laughs> <coughs> and they're asking how we can have less pedestrian fatalities. Hey. Well, come out and look. Thank you and God bless you for- This is a story about the global citizen-led fight to make our streets safer. That was good. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's so powerful, and uh, and you say there, you know, it's it's a global fight, and it's uh, in a citizen uh, led, um, but there's also many many countries that in many cities that have taken the lead, and uh, in you profile, you know, Copenhagen, you talk a little bit about the Netherlands, uh, and you touch upon a few other uh, countries as well, like uh, Vision Zero in Sweden, and the fact that Norway has made some tremendous strides in uh, in the Vision Zero uh, movement. Um, I imagine for you, I mean, coming into this in t after the 2018 release of Three Seconds, like you, you sort of alluded to, you just you learned a heck of a lot. What was one of the most surprising things that, you know, was a revelation for you, you know, from this process? Well, it, it's really from beginning to end, but I will start with one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure that we did not do is um, we didn't want this to be a film that made people cry. Mm -hmm. We didn't want um, to have, dead bodies, or we didn't want to create a film where there was another reason you needed to bury your head in the sand and say, enough. Right. I know the world is terrible. I don't want, I, you know, I don't want to hear about it. And so um, right from the beginning, we wanted to make this inspirational. And there's, you know, there, there are one of our central characters, Dulcie, you know, does, ha did have an incident, but that's really the only, um, piece in it. And um, so we wanted to make something that was very inspirational. A as far as what was surprising, um, I think that the, the whole jaywalking and that term and, you know, even a lot of the history and sort of 
listening to some of the films, the documentaries, the, the propaganda that was out there in, in those early years, um, that was surprising. I will tell you the other thing, there, there are many things, but I was not going to go to Copenhagen. I was like, that is so stereotypical. Of course, I'm not going to go to Copenhagen. Yes, everybody bikes there. It's beautiful. Of course, a documentary like this should go to Copenhagen. But everybody knows that that, that place is great. Um, and then when I found out that it really um, had a, 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 a driving culture, that the streets had been design, redesigned for cars, that um yeah like right here <laughs> yeah right and that it wasn't always this amazing place for biking and that the reasons why they um changed one was certainly the economy which was a great story for a u.s audience to hear that it was you know less expensive for them to embrace that biking culture and infrastructure that and um and two, that it was grassroots movements right. that created change. Yeah. Then I knew, oh, wait a minute. Now I really do need to go to Copenhagen to tell that side of the story. Yeah, yeah. And and you talk about it in the film, and it's something that uh, uh, that we talk about a lot here on the Active Towns podcast, is that uh, – Places like uh, like Denmark, like Copenhagen, places like uh, Amsterdam, uh, they they aren't always what we think of as Amsterdam now. I mean, they did go through that movement, and because uh, you you had Peter Norton on as well, and and again he's been on the, the the podcast a couple of times, he also points out that we too had this type of level of protest, uh, you know, dating back as early as the 1930s, 1930s, 1940s, into the 19, you know, 50s. This is from the 1950s, but then also into the 1960s and 70s, we were protesting, but it was just motordom really put a cap on it in our, in our society. Whereas in, because of a, a variety of different factors, um, you know, in, in other places, it, it stuck, you know, they were able to start turning the, the tide a little bit uh, more. So I, I wasn't, I'm not surprised that that was a surprise for you <laughs> Yeah. because I, I run into that all the time. You know, when I, when I share this with people outside of my little bubble, uh, you know, they're like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, really? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, wh what else was like one of the, the big surprises for you? When, when you were going through this? Well, I mean, it's all over the board here, but some of it is people's reactions to the topic. Right. Um, uh, often I would hear people, I, I'd start to talk about, you know, this street project and what I'm doing and sort of blab on. And, and I've often had a hard time sort of putting it into the one line sales pitch of what this project is about because our streets, our largest public spaces, right touch on so many aspects of our lives that how do I compartmentalize it into one marketing pitch? Right. Um, but anyway, I would sit around with friends and we'd talk about it and, and they'd be like deer in headlights, like, oh my God, I had no idea that this was an issue that I actually needed to care about. Right. Um, and so that, um, that really hit home in that ev everything that I did with this story was how can I not preach to the choir? Right, how right. can I make this accessible to everybody? Um, uh, and, you know, so that that's some of it. I, I know all your folks know a lot about the, the, ra the racial profiling aspects yeah. of jaywalking. I had no idea about, but about that sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I have, a, uh, there's a whole bunch of statistics about, you know, the number of, people that are um, who is targeted and how they're targeted the the, the fines and how that impacts lower income folks right. um, how um, those interactions with jaywalkers and police end up being confrontational in very unexpected ways because people are confused and don't even realize why they're being stopped let alone the fact you know and the other thing that was I, I should say that was really interesting is this concept of um democratic streets 
Right. And, and so I thought in the beginning I was making a safety film and I was going to try to make this safety film as sexy as I possibly could. Yeah. So it didn't sound like it was a safety film. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, I was realized that we were making a film about democratic streets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in streets have a, a very, very interesting history, obviously. I mean, you know, streets have been around for the better part of four to six thousand years. I mean, ever since we started coming together as civilizations, we've had streets. And, you know, as as it's pointed out in, in the segment, uh, you know, where Peter was was talking is like it really wasn't until you know, 120 some odd years ago when all of a sudden this newfangled, uh, you know, four wheeled device that has a motor, you know, came into the picture where there was suddenly a, a, a tension in there. We had a, a few years, a, a decade or so of where there was a sort of awkward mis- mix between the streetcar lines, the horse drawn carriages, the people walking, people on bikes been around since the the 1800s and um and, and then all of a sudden the, the the car and then you know it was just really really interesting though um how that you know kind of all changed where you know where streets used to be for people <laughs> you know all of a sudden right. streets are only for cars what are you insane you know it's like it, one of the quotes that, that peter has in there is that you know we 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 I'll, I'll make sure I get it right here because I wrote it down. Is is he said? You know, whatever we grew up with seems normal, and it's it was interesting because that came up a couple of different times in the film, where like when Jim and and Dulcie were like reminiscing of what it was like to play games in the streets, and so we don't have to go back all the way to the 1920s. I mean generations that are adults now can remember when streets were something different. It's fascinating. Yeah. That, and that was a really beautiful section of the documentary and why we wanted to leave in there. The, um, uh, Jim lives in Queens and is part of the 34th Avenue, one of the founders really of the, of a very successful open streets uh, project. And, um, and he ends up crying in the film. And, um, so when he and our central character, Dulcy, are having this conversation, you know, it's always a challenge. We have hours and hours of footage and what do we leave in and what do we um, cut? And that sort of natural communication between them conversation was was really beautiful and we wanted to leave it in. But I, And I will tell you that this is one of the few projects I've ever done where we had I don't know, hundreds of hours of yeah. footage that never made it in. Um, we thought, you know, in the spirit of that three seconds behind the wheel, that some of the documentary would would look at human behavior on the streets. Right. So the New York DOT allowed us to take um, – footage uh, from their security cameras. So I had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of hours that they gave us over, um, I think it was six or eight cameras and over the course of several days. And, and, um, our uh, one of the producers, Lindsay Thompson, who's off to the side listening, was one of, one of the poor souls that had to l- look through all of this footage. Right. And um, and then we realized that this was back in the day when we also thought, you know, we were maybe we would catch some people, you know, on their cell phones in traffic or whatever. Right. And and as it turned out, it just it 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 wasn't there, you know. Right. And anyway, so to it's just there was all this footage that we had to figure out how best to piece together. And I don't even remember your original question, but that's, that's where we went. No, but I can, I'm laughing because I can, I can relate to the hours and hours of footage, um, you know, other than the podcast and, uh, you know, producing this, I'm also producing profile videos for the YouTube channel as well. And so, uh, and, and honestly, in, in full disclosure, I was uh, filming a documentary up until the pandemic as well. I was trying to follow 10 different cities that were um, making uh, huge strides in trying to increase their cycle network. And for a variety of different reasons, it is sort of, you know, fizzled out. And then the, the launch of the podcast and the launch of the YouTube channel. But I, I know I have 
literally hundreds of hours of stuff that I've yeah. shot over a, a three to five year period that I keep kind of going back to. I'm like, oh, wait, I, I've got some stuff from the streets of Paris that I shot that I can use in this video. And so I go back and do that. Now, you mentioned Dulcie is one of the, the main characters. And one of the other main characters is profiled here in, in this in the snapshot. Um, and it's about the story in Phoenix. Tell, tell a little bit of, of background about uh, the Phoenix story. Yes, and that is um, is a really interesting story. So, you know, uh, we started this project at the end of 2018 and early 2019, um, and we were doing research all over the country, all over the world, trying to figure out how, what kinds of stories we were going to tell, where we were going to tell those stories. And we noticed um, a story in the Arizona Republic newspaper um, that they had did in 2019 about the most dangerous streets in Phoenix. And we were like, well, that's really interesting. And the, and the story was really good and really um, thought out. Um, and so it, it, it sort of piqued our interest. And then really around the same time we were discovering Phoenix, um, the city council had voted down the possibility, even the possibility of their city staff researching how they might eliminate pedestrian deaths using a vision zero framework. So we thought, wait a minute, they, they have, it's considered one of the most dangerous places for pedestrians in the United States. And they voted down this vision, this concept of bringing vision zero into the city. Now that's really interesting. What's going on there? Why would why would they feel that way? And that's when we started to do some work. And we we went we chatted with a whole bunch of sort of adv advocacy groups, nonprofits, um, city council members, that sort of thing. And um, Stacy Champion rose to the top. She's very much an advocate in the community on a variety of different topics, not just street safety. Um, but she was this is a visual medium, you know, the film is yeah. a visual medium. She was somebody who was very comfortable on camera, had, um, was able to tell the story of what's going on in Phoenix. And so we decided, okay, there, there's definitely something worth talking about here. This clip is crazy. That's the image. That is the monster yeah. that is there in that Melrose district, uh, in, yeah. in Phoenix. I mean, we're talking about a six lane strode with the center turn lane. So it's actually seven lanes, high speed corridor. Oh yeah. Insane. Uh, yeah. And you know, I ha it's not, I suppose it's not that different from a, a whole, whole bunch of Sunbelt states. Um, but I hadn't, you know, you, once you start learning about this topic, the, these issues, you, you view the world in a very different way, right? right. Yeah. I can't even go on vacation to a beach community without like analyzing how the streets are and how hard it is for me to walk across the street and all this stuff. It's, it's yeah. like, you know, my mind. Well, welcome to our um, world. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and so I um, was, we went to Phoenix and um, Stacy was wonderful and easy to talk with. And uh, but I wasn't expecting it to be so easy to see what she was talking about. Right. Um, and so even the night I got there, I was in an Airbnb before I had even met Stacy. And um, uh, Phoenix has all these wonderful new little restaurants. Um, I don't know how new they are. They seemed cool and interesting and new to me. And I wanted to go to this little taqueria down the street. It was a few houses down on the other side of the street. Yeah. And so I just, I love to walk. And so I parked the car. I, I get, you know, I walk out the driveway. I take my left turn. I go to the end of the street. I look at the, the restaurant and I realize I can't get there. <laughs> I, you know, but it is actually. You can see it, but you can't get there from here. Right. Like it would truly be terrifying for yeah. me to try to cross that street. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I'm like, oh, that's a shame. I really want to go there. So my only option would be to go back and get my car and go around the block and drive. And that would be insane to me. Right. Um, or I just walk down and find something on this other side of the street. And so, of course, you know, that's what that's what I did. Um, and that was my first taste of it all. So anyway, we get there. We do our interview the next day with 
Stacy. She shows us this Connor that she's talking about. And then we try to do what we do all the time is like we shoot people, film people doing what they do. And so she was just, I was like, well, why don't you do, walk across the street? This is safe. It's a crosswalk, right? Let's walk across the street. We'll get some shots of, of traffic, et cetera. And, and then maybe Joe, our, our director of photographer, photography can follow you across. And, um, I mean, we had been with her for a half hour, maybe, and they nearly got run over. And this yeah. is not an exaggeration. We're in a crosswalk. We're behaving safely. It's two people. Yes, he has a camera with him, but we're in a crosswalk walking across the street. And and I filmed it with my cell phone because I thought I was just getting some, oh, some cute little marketing shots or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, they – so – and then over the course of the day, we are just shooting traffic and car after car is zooming through red lights. Yeah. Like it's part of b the behavior there. Now, and you can start to understand it. Like if you're driving really fast, if you know you can get away with it, if there's n what you think is nothing in front of you, the other people in the other direction kind of their light, it, ha it hasn't registered or they can't ramp up speed enough, you know you can get away with it. And so, um, so there was that, and then it was really in 15 minutes we shot seven cars running red light. That's great. Which just blew yeah. my mind. We didn't. We just picked a random street. Um, the other thing um, was that because the streets are so wide, people, if they know they've passed, you've passed their car, then they go, even though you're still in the crosswalk. Right. So you have these people, you know, that are still that are moving across the crosswalk, even though you're still in the middle of the crosswalk, which is something really different that I that I hadn't seen before, because I'm right. used to once the pedestrian goes into the crosswalk, right. people stop until you're on the sidewalk on the other side. Yeah. And uh, so a lot of that was really um, interesting for me. And I, and I just thought, Oh my God, this really, it is really hard to be a pedestrian here, let alone, you know, yeah. even trying to cycle here. Yeah. And um, what's brilliant about your, your film too, is it, it doesn't, again, um, it's not trying to demonize drivers and, and pass absolutely. blame. It, it's like you get to the point where you start to highlight the key message that, that we talk about all the time is it's the design. We've designed it this way. It's performing exactly the way it was designed to perform. Exactly. And that's exactly. something that uh, Jesse Singer talks about in, in her book, uh, There Are No Accidents. I mean, this is th these are not accidents. These are results. We're getting the results of the system that was designed this way. Um, I have a little video clip here called Safer okay. Communities. Let's play this okay. and we'll talk a little bit about that. This isn't just a large city issue. Communities of all sizes can make their streets safer. Adequate street lighting, crosswalks in places where people really want to cross, traffic signals that allow enough time for people to cross, curbs with ramps so wheelchair users aren't stuck in the street, protected bike lanes, bus stops in safe places. These are some basic safety measures that make streets safer. And I would even argue that it's it's also just the basics of building a productive street, a productive community. Right. <laughs> it's not even it doesn't even have to be about safety. It can right. be just about creating public space where people are welcome. There's that people right. orientation that, that Dulcie talked about. Yeah, and it's so true. And, and thank you for pointing out the not demonizing anyone or, you know, we all lo love cars. Well, I mean, I like my car. I do. I like my car. It's convenient. It's easy, whatever. But I also really love to bike and I really love to walk passionately yes. love to walk and I and I live in a walkable community now but I also have a car and a bike and um, so you know the idea is that again getting back to those democratic streets uh, yeah. these this is our largest public space and we want to be able to uh, I don't have to tell your audience but we want to be able to use our streets in a variety of ways and and if Jim and his community on 34th Avenue needs to use it in a certain way then he they have a right to use it in that way and if we want protect safe protected bike lanes so that everybody uses um, 
a bike lane, not just, you know, people that are road warriors, uh, well, then we deserve to have that. Um, and it doesn't have to be really expensive. Um, uh, so, uh, so that gets at the heart of that. And those animations, certainly, that's what we tried to do to show that it, you know, to create livable, vibrant spaces. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it doesn't have to be that hard. So this is the, the landing page for the film. So this is the thestreetproject.com is the website. And uh, it's, it's one thing to, you know, be uh, producing content, whether it's a podcast or the YouTube videos that I, that I produce, uh, documentary films, as you've just done here and have been doing throughout your career. It's, it's one thing to, to have this, you know, moving educational content but if it doesn't get outside of our bubbles, it kind of falls flat. And so one of the great things that I love about when, when I go to your website here, I see host a screening. Talk a little bit about how impactful and powerful that is, because it seems like if we have this ability to uh, host screenings, community screenings, uh, welcome other people in, we might be able to break out of, you know, the echo chamber that, that I've been in for the last 15 years uh, doing work in this arena. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that because it's really important. Um, I, we were lucky enough to be able to create this film, to have a good budget, to get distribution um, through PBS International, and it's on Amazon and, and, a, and a whole bunch of other places. And um, uh, But what we very much want it to be is a tool for grassroots organizations and others to use to help them do the good work that they're already doing. Right. And so the concept behind hosting a screening is either you're hosting a, a full screening in your community and doing a Q&A afterwards, you might decide that you just want to uh, show, uh, show clips and do conversations around specific topics. The act, actually, the documentary is structured in a way where it is chunked out so that people can just um, have a conversation around a certain aspect of, of the of film. Um, so we have somebody now that is uh, working on what we call the, the, the impact campaign. And the idea is over the next 18 months, um, the film will be made available to organizations and individuals who would like to sort of lead a charge in their community. And, you know, it's a it's sometimes these visual tools can help create change, right? You know, we can all be shouting as loud as, as possible and doing our charts, et cetera, and, and studies. And every now and then maybe, um, whether it's uh, a trailer, a section, a full doc, maybe that can spark enough emotion with the right people right. that um, that are in power to create change, um, that it makes a difference in some way. So whether it's your listeners and viewers or other folks that you all know that might be interested in hosting a screening, you know, it might draw other folks in who wouldn't normally care about this topic. They may, you know, I, we actually, um, tomorrow night, um, we're in Providence. We're doing a screening there. Right. And we've been doing screenings in New York and, and in New Jersey and Vermont so far, um, even, um, yeah. And so, anyway, it's available. It's a tool. I hope it gets used that way so that it is for a broader audience and we're not just preaching to the choir. Fantastic. And I see that we uh, have two other uh, little clickable uh, squares here. We've got Amazon Prime and we've got uh, PBS America. Uh, how, what's the process for somebody um, to, to access the, 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 the film through those mechanisms? Uh, okay, so let's see. And there's a couple of things. For your international audience, it's being distributed through PBS International. So what okay. that means is that countries will um, decide uh, and, and television stations around the world will decide that they, in fact, uh, would like to license the film. And then um, it ends up being streamed and broadcast on their stations in, in various countries. So if, if, you're, if you don't see it yet, feel free to um, shout out to your local um, television stations wherever you live to see um, if they're interested in carrying it um, or streaming it. 
Uh, and um, the, those buttons really do link you. PBS America was just launched. It's an online streaming service. Okay. Um, and uh, the thing about it is it's got commercials in it, so it can be a little... Um, tough to watch it that way. Amazon sure. Prime is it's typical, you know, you could uh, download it for rental or, you know, stream okay. it however you want. Um, so that's really the variety of ways the streaming online, the international, the hosting, the screening yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, slowly over time, there won't be any way, you know, way that people aren't easily able to watch it. Right, right. One of the things that it, this reminded me um, a, a lot of of this particular documentary that that came out a few years ago and 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 won a whole host of awards, including here at South by Southwest in in Austin, um, a Chasing Coral and a, a group of filmmakers out of Boulder, Colorado that have, have done some wonderful uh, documentary films, including Chasing Ice, which was also another award winning film. Yeah, yeah. And um, and they really were intentional about this becoming an issue, uh, 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 an action, you know, take action, a movement. And so uh, you, you talked about the, the, you know, the engagement campaign and the things, because I think what you noticed from going through this experience is that this wasn't just like a normal documentary that you're going to wipe your hands of and walk away. Right. You you sort of kicked into a hornet's nest of and caught a tiger by the tail with my mixed metaphors here uh, <laughs> in terms of, yeah, I mean, it's like, what next? We need to take action. We can't just keep accepting the fact that, uh, you know, in the United States alone, uh, approximately 115 to 120 people are killed every single day on our roadways. It's like the size of a, a small jetliner crashing every single day. And that's just the fatalities. It doesn't even take into consideration the serious debilitating injuries that take place. I mean, million plus annually on our streets. But it's not news. It's not in the ether. And, and so that activism and that that movement, creating that movement is a huge part. And so I was very encouraged to see that there's a, there's the beginnings of that. And, and certainly the screenings, the onsite screenings is, is a great first step in that arena. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what I was alluding to earlier, how this has been an ongoing journey and, and discovery process because it, you know, I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning and I didn't really realize, um, I knew that there would be some sort of uh, impact the campaign that we would try to do because it's it's not an unusual technique. You know, right. people that do documentaries these days often do impact campaigns because you want to extend, um, you know, the possibilities of who can see this documentary and, and make an impact. We all try. We right. would be doing other things in life if we just we try to use the medium for, to to create change to be helpful right. and um, and then. Uh, you know, I uh, slowly over time, I, I fell in love with the topic in a way that I never expected to. I'm a yeah. storyteller. It's not, right. you know, I, I go in a lot of different directions. And it, it became clear that this wasn't just about, this wasn't just another documentary, another story, that it was touching my life and, and the people that I know and the quality of my life and the quality of our crew and all of the people around us. And, and that there was a really active grassroots world out there that cared about this issue. And so then it became obvious that it needed to be a tool for them in right. whatever way, shape or form. So, you know, I guess at the moment we're viewing it as just that all of you guys have been doing this research and living and breathing it for years. And, um, so I don't know the best way to reach any one particular community or address the issue on a global scale or, you know, there are so many pe smart people out there that are, that are doing this work. So if this can at least be a visual tool that helps you tell your story, that helps you, you and your community, helps you, your community, <laughs> helps you help your community to change yeah, yeah. minds, then, um, then, that, then that's, that's all that I can ask for as a storyteller, right? 
So we, you know, it is the streetproject.com where people can connect with us directly and then we can help you in all sorts of ways. Um, like licensing the film and giving you posters and um, all sorts of materials to help you create your event and to make it super easy for you to create your event. And I even tell folks, you know, you can make it a fundraiser. You know, right. if, if there is a nonprofit group out there that wants to charge for admission, that wants to invite their local city officials to have a conversation afterwards, that um, however you want to do it, if it can help you with um, a, your uh, creating sort of um, prestige or um, uh, in your community or help you raise money for what you're doing in your community. Great. It's all wonderful. Um, and if we can come out and help you in some way, we will do that as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the, it's, uh, we're going to uh, stick to an 18 month campaign and then we'll see where it goes from there. We're still raising um, corporate money to make sure that we have uh, can continue to fund our staff to help people along the way. I think we'll be okay. I, I think there's a lot of people that care about this issue and want to want to support it. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, so that's what we're what we're up to at the moment, and we're open to suggestions. So if you yeah. or any of your listeners say, "Hey, this is what you should be doing to get the message across," we're open to ideas. Well, one of the things that that I find most appealing about this film. And, uh, and, and, and this type of storytelling to begin with is the fact that it ends on a positive note. It ends with a sense of hope because what you experienced, especially since you were filming through the pandemic era, is that you you came out the other side and you you actually saw some great success stories to be able to highlight and that's the whole point, because if it's just doom and gloom and, oh, these numbers are, are shocking and this is horrendous. And, uh, you know, then, like you said, you know, people just kind of put their head in the sand and they say, OK, well, this isn't going to happen. And that's what I try to do with the Active Towns channel, too, is to try to profile the success stories so that we can see that, hey, you know, we can be like Copenhagen and the Netherlands, too. Oh. You know, just a few years ago, a few decades ago, they were in the same boat in terms of, you know, streets that were, were clogged with cars and, and, and yeah. battling things. So, You know, what's interesting also, but aside from my being intrigued by the, uh, the, the history piece with Copenhagen and the activism, when I actually got there, I am somebody who, who was always terrified to bike in cities. I just mm -hmm. would you know, I would not do that. And it opened up my world and uh, my mind when I was able to bike wherever I wanted to go. And to the point of, of the folks where we were talking with there, this wasn't about exercise. Um, and it really was about just getting from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And, um, and that just because you're on a bike doesn't mean you want to take your, you know, this glorious way through the park in order to get back to where you originally wanted. And it would have been, you know, a five minute car ride and it's going to be now a 50 minute bike ride. Um, it really was that it, in order to get from point A to point B, it would be a 50 minute car ride and a five minute bike ride. Well, so in taking that concept, um, when I got back home, I was in New York City and I got off the train at Grand Central Station. I was with my husband and we were going to an event and um, I just casually looked down at my GPS and I, I just to get directions to figure out. I like to walk. So I thought I, either I was going to walk or I was going to take the um, subway and I looked down and I saw, huh, it's going to take me, what was it? It was going to take 40 minutes by Uber and around 38 minutes by um, um, walking or subway, somewhere around that. But the, it was going to take 17 minutes by bike. Right. And I thought, huh, well, <laughs> Let me out. So I went and looked over at the city bikes yeah. and I saw, okay, they're right there, right in front of Grand Central Station. All right. Well, I'm still not convinced yet. Let me go around the corner and see if there are protected bike lanes. Right. And I walked around the corner and sure enough, there was the <laughs> bike lane. I'm like, 
all right, John, I, you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. Let's, yeah. let's go for it. So I hop on the bike. We get download the app. We do the whole thing. I am 10 years ago. I never would have done this. Right. And I hop on the bike. We go all the way down to where we need to go. And it is delightful. I felt completely safe. Yeah. We get there. And then at the end of that, um, I have a friend from college who's way up on the Upper East Side, and he's like, I can't, I can't come down and meet you. It's too far. I've only got the short window of time. Can you come up here? And we're like, all right, I think we can. And we ended up biking for like 85 blocks. And, <laughs> uptown, and it was the first time I realized that Uptown actually is up. Like there, there's a slow <laughs> hill all the way up. Um, but it was so wonderful and it felt joyful and it felt like I was back in Copenhagen again. And I just couldn't believe that I, at my age, was biking when I, not in a million years when I was 18, would I ever bike in Manhattan. Yeah. And I felt completely safe. And it was, I think it was like November. It was, so I had my yeah. winter coat on. It was, so anyway, to the point that I think that um, if we're viewing it as a way to get from point A to point B, that if we create these safe infrastructures so that folks like me feel right. confident enough to bike, um, you know, I don't know. It's all about quality yeah. of life and, I, and options for people, right? Just it options. Is. It's, it's about yeah. options. And the silhouette of a picture here, there's two of them here, uh, absolutely beautiful, on one of the Copenhagen bridges. And it's, you know... It, Michael Koval Anderson, you know, says, you know, hey, we're, we're just, this is about pragmatic and this is the, you know, it, yes, but there's also some, there's some beauty to it and the, and it's safe and it is welcoming and it, it makes it so that, uh, yeah, it's not just that it's possible, it's that you're truly invited to right. be able to do that. And that's what the protected infrastructure does. That's what separated infrastructure does. That's what that's what creating beautiful, intriguing, welcoming spaces, public spaces does for us to encourage us humans to actually walk a little bit more, to actually yeah. bike a little bit more. Right. Yeah. Right. And actually with that photo, I know um, Michael will say, well, that was an example of infrastructure that was created that was actually quite expensive. And it was like, it's super beautiful and glamorous and all of that, but that's not really what it's all about. And it was, it made beautiful photos. Um, but at the end of the day, where what, what folks like um, uh, uh, Julia at the DOT had said was, uh, you know, building it out with temporary materials and making sure it works, making sure people use it first, and yeah. then you can build it out in a more permanent way later. You know, I know, I know, I don't have to tell your audience this, but it just, it just doesn't have to be that complicated, and it, it doesn't, doesn't have yeah. to be that expensive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we need to get the word out to everybody else. <laughs> Hence the momentum, momentum, yes. and movement oh, growing. Just, yes. Yeah. Any final thoughts that you'd uh, like to leave us here with here today? Uh, well, you know, like I said, I thought I was doing a safety doc and I realized I was really doing something about um, creating democratic streets yeah. for all um, so that, uh, you know, we're not just we're not anti-car by any means. We're just about yeah. giving people access. So I, I think that. Um, um, again, if this can be a tool for folks, please contact me. Uh, I, I just, I hope that you all can spread the word so it's not just about our little group of people watching this and going, oh yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's more about, you know, opening some eyes for folks who can really create change in their community. And what did we learn most from COVID is that it, you know, you can block a street overnight. It didn't, you don't have to have all these complicated processes and procedures and years of waiting and studies and tests. We can do things in a really simple way. Let's see how it works and then, and then build it out from there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. When this the dust settles on on this and the movement and, and all of that. It's not going to ever settle. We're going to we're going to keep you engaged for a while. But I, I have a feeling you have other projects that you need to get working yeah. on. What's what's up next for you? Well, um, they're really unrelated at the moment. I'm open to suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but right now we're doing a, a five part series on the history of Las Vegas. Uh -huh. uh, I'm doing a project that is um, on Mesa Verde National Park. Okay. Uh, you know, we're just all over the place right now. But um, and then working on this impact campaign to to really um, 
you know, get as many people uh, on board and, and learning. And, well, uh, since you, you mentioned it earlier, you can't unsee or unlearn what you've now learned. So I have yeah. a feeling that especially with the, the, Las, Ve- the Las Vegas history, it, it's going to, your, your eyes are going to be like, oh, yeah, this is connected to that. <laughs> weirdly all connected. It's so weirdly connected. It is. When yeah. you, you start looking at how the roads are designed in Las Vegas versus, you know, it's all part of that Sun Belt. And, and uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, how we move about our communities um, on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's all connected. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, in even, you know, from uh, the strip, you know, going right down the middle of Las Vegas, uh, you know, the most iconic street that they have. And the fact that, you know, on any given hour of the day throughout the entire day, you can have, you know, 10x number of pedestrians versus number of cars uh, and how they have to manage that. And years ago, they started doing really, really wide sidewalks and then pedestrian overpasses. Mm-hmm. And so that's going to it's that's going to be, I, I think, a little bit of of, you know, the story now in the sense that you can't unsee it. <laughs> yeah, right. oh, it, it is true. I am yeah. really hopeful. I, I, you know, I think more and more people are biking and walking and caring about um, uh, the their infrastructure more than ever. And when when we've been doing these screenings, they've been to um, packed houses. Right. And uh, even you know now with post COVID and maybe people feeling a little bit more comfortable about being in theaters or being outside. Tomorrow night's uh, event is outside. Um, that. Um, you know, we can create change. There's a lot of hope out there. There's a lot of energy around it. And I think even with the federal infrastructure dollars, right, that prioritize um, pro- projects that have a, a bike, a, a walking, um, consider all uses. Um, if those projects are, are prioritized, we really have a fighting chance at this. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And hey, this is a call to action for all of you who are listening to this and all of you who are watching this. Uh, you know, please share share this interview within your networks and uh, also, uh, you know, share the links to the, the website, share the links to the film. If you have the opportunity to host a screening in your community, uh, please do that and, uh, and, and, and invite some people outside of the bubble, you know, get share this with your, your your parents and share this with your grandparents if they're around uh spread it far and wide and hopefully we can really grow the awareness and as you mentioned it earlier that sense of hope the the sense that actually we can do this we can sh- turn the tide and we can uh, make our, our streets more democratic and streets for people more like streets for people so good stuff jennifer thank you so very much it's been an absolute joy and honor having you on the active towns podcast oh, thank, thank you so much for for giving me the time on, on your awesome podcast i appreciate it thank you all so much for watching this episode i hope you enjoyed it and if you did remember give it a thumbs up <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend and if you haven't done so already be honored to have you subscribe to the channel just hit the subscription button down below and ring the notification bell so that you can customize your notifications when I produce new content. Once again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.